Go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a regular scheduled meeting in the Sunderland Select Board. I'd like to call to order at uh, 6.31 or so. We're almost right on time tonight. Um, it's February 14th, 2022. First order of business is the uh, approval of the minutes of February 7th. Motion. Second. Yeah, motion made and second to approve the minutes of February 7th as presented. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Jeff, 3-0. Next up, we have under new business, the Franklin County Technical School budget presentation. So, Rick, are you going to get the presentation? Yeah, it would be myself and Russ. Um, uh, he's on the line as well. Um, I just wanted to, uh, do I have... Do you have the ability to help me share my screen so I can go through the presentation? We do. Yeah, you should just be able to hit the share screen okay. button. All right. Fine. All right. Um, what we did differently this year is we changed our entire budget book. I, I think there was a, um, I think um, my administrative assistant sent you a copy today. so. Apologize for the late, but it hasn't even been voted uh, upon by our school committee yet, not until the March meeting. So we're still very much in draft form, but all the numbers are pretty accurate from what we can gather. Uh, the booklet is totally changed. I'm going to walk you through it. It's going to take about a 10 or 15 minute um, presentation. And then we'll get to the Sunderland assessment. We'll get to the Sunderland enrollment and where we project it to be for next year as well. Um, so the table of contents, I guess, uh, if you're new to the, the if you're new to the budget, the most important part of it is we go to the sources of funding, and that's is it's grant me access. All right, it's the sources of funding. Does everyone have that on their screen? Did they see that? Yep. Yep. All right. So we have the sources of funding. We have the if we have the major categories that we have every year. And the only difference that you're going to notice in this budget book, I mean, the assessment to the town is a 3% increase. Um, when we click on the blue, it will explain a little bit about um, the assessments to town. Now, this is probably um, fine for the people on the finance committee, but this is really geared to the general public so they have an opportunity to scroll through our budget and come to a better understanding. Um, when we go to the next one, it's our capital assessment debt. That's from our old windows and doors and roof and pavement project and where that all falls into. As far as where it falls in for the town of Sunderland, if I click 2A, that takes me to the chart. All 2 does is explain what it is. It's an MSBA project, 15 year, what have you. If I click to 2A, it will bring us to the grid. And the Sunderland assessment um, is right here on this grid right here on that line. So about ten thousand eight hundred, um, and it, and that's uh, based on the U.S. Census population uh, rate to population, the equalized valuation, and then they come up with a formula, and that fluctuates a little bit from year to year, um, but we don't expect it to go up really much higher it will probably start to come down as we start to pay up more of the bond and if we go back to the sources of funding state aid transportation um, we anticipated a 75 percent reimbursement for regional transportation uh, we keep going back to knowing that the law indicates that it would be 100 percent um, reimbursement but as they put that last one little sentence in there that says subject to appropriation so that's a little um, ability to get out of that but nonetheless it picked up from other years um, but with this number here and we go down to our pupil transportation down here you notice we had a little bit of an increase because our enrollments still begin to tick up so we're counting on another bus being added to that route as well. So um, there's some other variables there, but we got reimbursed $765,000 out of that amount. 
Uh, tuition for non-member town, we had about 34, 35 students, so they pay anywhere between 20 and $25,000 per pupil, depending on if they have a special ed plan and what have you. Um, not the kind of price that's paid for our in-district towns, obviously. Um, and, and, and if they have anything highlighted in blue on this, if you scroll to, you see the fifth, it should take you to an explanation. Well, one of the areas I'm going to explain right now is our tuition from our pre-employment self-contained program. We generally take around $100,000 from that to help offset the operating budget. But this year, we're not able to take any. And that is because we don't have as many students attending the program. So we didn't have that money in the budget to pull any money from, and that pretty much explains it in that particular paragraph. Um, and then we have other revenues. We see the previous year we were at 25000 That's because we had additional surplus equipment that we sold off to auction in various locational areas. And we didn't have as much this past year. And it went back down to $10,000. That's, that's also the Medicaid reimbursement and other small revenue streams. The excess and deficiencies were pretty consistent since last year about $550,000 there. Um, and that total for the source of the funding comes to $14,358,140. I'm going to let Russ take the bottom half of the screen. I may stop him and get to an explanation session if needed. Um, and we'll carry on with this. So Russ, if you want to take the bottom half of the screen. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you to the town officials of Sunderland for having us here tonight. Uh, the bottom part of the screen is our appropriations, how we use our funding. So, as uh, Rick explained, we have a, a 14, a greater than 14.3 million dollar budget, which represents about a 6.7 percent increase in our total budget from uh, this fiscal year to last fiscal year. Um, as Rick also explained, and as you can probably have seen under sources of funding, we are a growing uh, school. One of the few schools in Western Mass, probably one of the few schools in the state that actually has growing enrollment. So our uh, Chapter 78 went up uh, roughly 14% this year in the, uh, for two reasons. Uh, the Student Opportunity Act, which was the rejiggering of the state foundation formula, uh, helped us out tremendously. So that uh, added to our funds from state aid. And then also we have the growing enrollment. So that helped our funds also for state aid. So with growing enrollment, uh, we also have growing staffing needs to, uh, to attend to those students. So some big areas that we grew uh, in, in uses of funding in the appropriation side is both in district leadership and instructional services, the top couple of lines there. District leadership went up for just under 5%, 4.7%. Um, and then instructional services, the faces in front of the kids, the teachers, the guidance counselors, that went up uh, almost 8%. So we are reinvesting both in uh, additional uh, administration, which takes the form of uh, an additional assistant principal. So now that we have uh, basically two assistant principals to help with any uh, transition or disciplinary issues for students as they come back from COVID into a full full schedule. And also instructional services. Uh, Rick, you can probably help me on this. We yeah. did add what, a math teacher, social studies teacher. Yeah, well, in order to, it, it's, it's um, yeah, we did add the math, the English. Um, we added some um, paraprofessionals. We added um, oh, a, a guidance counselor. And we added, um, yeah, and in, in, in the administration part of it, you know, that assistant principal is not a full-time assistant principal. It's only a half-time assistant principal. The other half of that job is the academic coordinator. We used to have a full-time academic coordinator about seven years ago. We're not back to that yet. Um, and we felt it necessary because of the changes in the students that we needed the half-time um, assistant principal as well and when you click on one of these things like instructional services it will take you to this column of the budget these codes that you see here are the codes that go directly to the line item of the budget that is these numbers are associated with our iVision software as well so we've got these weird codes in here 
but if you click them, so culinary arts salaries have gone up. So if I click them, it will take us to the culinary arts salary line item right here. As you can see, a few years ago, we were up like 187 or so, 220. It's gone up to 250. That's because we added the hospitality position, which we cut seven years ago. So we brought that position back. So it's it can be viewed as an ad, but it's really getting it back to level staffing. So I'll get to go back to Russ in a second. And Russ, you got it. Yep, okay, thank you. That's why you get the big bucks. You can always fill in the gaps for me. Uh, appreciate it. Um, the other items that uh, we're not correct to tell you were we are uh, got a contingency in the budget to add a, a bus group. We uh, our bus group is pretty full, and with the increase in enrollment, we're, we're probably going to need to add a route. So we added some funds there. Plan operations and maintenance is about a 16% increase. Uh, that's both for uh, a replacement of floor cleaning equipment and also an added custodial position. Uh, as you can imagine, we filled every space in our building. We don't have an assembly hall anymore. They got converted into four classrooms. Uh, so there's a lot of extra needs, custodial needs in the building. So we are uh, factoring in an extra custodian as we move forward. Plus we have a vet, uh, vet, veterinary science building that will hopefully go online sometime next year. That adds additional square footage that our custodians will have to take care of. So we're prepping for that. Uh, and then the only other uh, big increases in the um, uses or appropriation of funding is uh, we, we did put a cushion in our insurance, although insurance premiums from the Hampshire self-insurance group did not go up this year. It was a 0% increase. Um, we had, and I'm sure your other schools have probably had the same kind of migration. We had a lot of uh, spouses who might have lost their jobs or, or um, that uh, change jobs and they migrated on to the school's insurance policy. So that's why you'll see a little bit of an increase for us, both in our insurances um, uh, for active employees. And then the non-employee non insurances, that's our uh, building insurance, uh, liability, uh, property, things such as that. Uh, that's all increased, so we've got a bit of an increase in there. So basically in general, it's a 6.7% increase in the uh, total budget, and we just kind of gave you a flavor of some of the higher budget movers that are in our, our booklet. So, back to you. Yes, so as far as the budget is concerned, anything in blue for this year and for future years will be deemed a, di a discrepancy, whether a significant discrepancy up or down, and it should come with some sort of explanation. So as we go through the budget, I'm not going to go through all the explanations because we could be here for a long time. I just wanted to point you out that when you want to find something, you should be able to find it. And then if I go down to um, the line item of the budget, again, anything that's highlighted in blue would be a uh, significant discrepancy. These are all the transparency of our line amount of the budget from superintendent to business to um, it goes right down to everything from our uh, director of people personnel, our administration, our school leadership, our, our building technology, is our, all of our teachers. So this is where the area you will see the greatest months of increases and discrepancies that you'll see, you know, uh, you'll see like English salaries have gone up to 414. Obviously from a few years ago, we added a few teachers. Same in the math category, we were at 426 just a few years ago that we expended, and now we're at 525. So you'll start to see these discrepancies, and if you just wanted to find out a little bit about it, it will take you to the explanation, and if you click on the code, it will take you right back to the budget line item of the math salaries. So then I go down to um, the specialist teachers, we got textbooks, other materials. Um, you'll see this is an interesting line item. Vocational supplies go from zero dollars back a few years ago to thirty thousand dollars today. It's twenty-five thousand last year. What's happened is I'm going down. And we're doing a needs assessment. Take the plumbing shop, for instance, in their PCP piping, and their um, stock has gone up by more than forty-six percent. 
uh, carpentry, as everyone knows, the price of wood's gone through the roof. And in our machine tech shop, their stock's gone up. So we need budgetary stuff to keep the curriculum moving forward. The only reason why we ha had it here before, because we didn't have that significant increase. Um, so we have to have materials and supplies to help students with their projects and move the curriculum forward. So there's a discrepancy there. You'll see other discrepancies where the welding down in here has gone up by about four grand in their supply line item and plumbing's gone up a, a few grand. So these are the things to try to help offset some of the cost. Locational equipment, same thing. And then we went basically towards the end of the budget, you know, the custodial salaries that Ross mentioned earlier, you know, over the last several years we've gone up with you, and he didn't mention that we have a lot more going on, but once we get the new veterinary center up and running, that's another place that we have to go. Where I think we're all familiar in our schools with defogging equipment. Now we have a vocational, we have 14 vocational programs, which every machine needs to be wiped down. That never, I mean, yeah, we cleaned it before, but now because of COVID and the pandemic, we have to go in to disinfect each of our vocational knobs, handles, buttons. It's quite a, it's quite a labor of love, I should say. So there's our custodial salaries right here. And then um, getting to the important part for Summerlin, I'll get a scroll to that, is, well, first, as we mentioned earlier, this is our Chapter 70 month. We're receiving $5,470,000 approximately from Chapter 70 right here. We're receiving that $765,154. Both those numbers you saw in our sources of funding section of the budget. But what for the public, for Joe public that may not be familiar with how we get those numbers, I want them to be able to get them for themselves. We'll do a quick little thing. They go to the department, the cherry sheet, the Department of Revenue, it will take you to this sheet. When I go to all regional schools and I scroll down to Franklin County Tech and I click on submit, you could do this for Frontier, you could do this for any school, and you press submit, there's those numbers again. Chapter 70, 5470, retail, retail transportation, 565, I mean 765. So that just gives you an idea on how we get our numbers. Here's our next shot, all schools in the county, their enrollment for their high schools. I'm, I'm, I'm just focused on the high schools here. Frontier is the largest at 604. Um, and we're number two and followed by Ralph C. Maha. But as far as grades nine through 12, we probably have the highest enrollment. Um, and these other schools are grades seven through 12. And this, here's the breakdown where all of the population is. If you ever wanted to find out how I got those numbers, you just click on the link and it will take you right to the state website and you can find your school and get right to the exact enrollment that I have here. That we're getting closer to our trends. Our enrollment, we're currently at 546 in district. We're expecting 566 next year. And that's probably our cap. Um, for the next five to seven or eight years, and I'll show you why in the next slide. I think that's our maximum that we're going to have moving forward. Um, we have 121 so seniors. We're going to bring in about 150 or so freshmen, and that will put us right in that ballpark. And we are understanding that there are freshmen, sophomores, and juniors and seniors that will leave during the course of the year, which will make up the difference. So that's probably where we're going to be at by October 1 of next year. And I gather that from the Franklin County Census data and the DESE data of enrollment. So if you want to click on any one of those links to see where we're at, you can certainly do that. Here's the key table for enrollment. Just follow the blue bar of the file left that says 662 up here. That was the total number of available eighth graders back in 2015-16. That number fluctuated, went down, up, and then maintained down, up. Today, this past year, we had 625. You're going to notice this other line, this gray line. That's the percentage of kids that enrolled out of that total number to get us to the orange line. So if I take the 662, 
If I take 19.9%, I'll come up with 132 students who enrolled at Franklin County Tech. Now you're looking at that number and you're saying over here today we took 167. But let's look at, we took a higher percentage back here than we did here. Here's why. That 132 that came in, we had only 156 applications. And out of that 156 applications, 136 were eligible, and which 132 came. So there wasn't a waiting list. No waiting list here. No waiting list here. No waiting list here. No waiting list really here for qualified students. The waiting list just happened in the last several years, where today that 167 represents almost 280 applicants in which we had qualified students. So now there's a waiting list. Back here, there was not. Our projected enrollment moving forward to 625 in the catchment area, we can see the trend. It's going down. It's going down. It may even go down lower than that. It might go down a little higher than that, but we know one thing for sure, it's going down. With that, our enrollment will begin to go back down a little bit. So we know this moving forward, and that's how we're going to um, make sure we budget appropriately. And our special education population for grades 9 through 12 continues to be the highest in the county and we are proud to take students who need hands-on learning and that extra advantage for our special education budget for the high school tends to be a little bit more. And these numbers are coming right off the state. So whatever numbers you see in any of these graphs, just click on the link and it will take you to how I got them. Here's the town of Sunderland. Your enrollment today uh, for the October 1 count was six students. Now, we're projecting 12. And how are we doing that? We have the one that's graduating, that takes it down to five. And we have seven applications. Again, we are not at the point of the application process which admits students. However, if all seven were to get in, you would have 12 and that would bring you close to the enrollment that you had back in 2012. Um, so here's your trend recently. You know, the debt number will either be lower or slightly higher, but that's just a rough estimate um, until we do who's actually going to come when we go through the enrollment numbers. And Ross, you want to take this screen? Yes, so here, uh, if I were a finance committee member or a select board member here, so, uh, one of the more important screens uh, it shows if you'll scroll it a little bit more we can see Sunderland it'll show your town uh, assessment number so the doc the doctor orange column is a uh, minimum contribution as dictated by the state formula so uh, the one below that bracket so the town of Sunderland you can see you're at uh, the state's dictating that you spend at least 90687 on Franklin County Tech with your local tax dollars uh, then we also have columns that represent some additional assessments that we charge above and beyond the state minimum. Uh, then you'll see a, a, a credit of $6,044. That's part of that $550,000 of E&D that we're using to balance our budget next year. So we reduce your assessment by that. So it comes out with about a $104,000 operating assessment for Sunderland for next year. So that's based on those uh, eight weeks that Rick was showing you uh, previously. So that's the October 1 count that just uh, went, went by, and that's the count we use for the upcoming budget year. So we have also have an enrollment trend uh, screen, so this helps you see what the trends have been in the last four years. So you'll see your students went from 6 to 10 to 8, now back down to 6. Next year we expect it to jump back up to 12. Um, but for, for Sunderland for this year, the year that you're building a budget, uh, you'll save about $40,000 from Franklin County Tech because of the de decrease in enrollment. Um, there's also a, uh, if, if uh, you haven't seen it, there's an email or a letter out there that we had a surplus from, uh, we call it a COVID surplus, or so a surplus in our e d that went above our 5% cap. So there's $111,000 that we're sending back to our town. Sunderland's share of that is about $1,600, $1,700. So we will probably further reduce your assessment from the 104 by 
by another sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. But our school committee hasn't voted on the on the strategy of sending that back to the towns yet. So we will keep you apprised, but certainly by our March meeting, a decision will be made. Either you'll receive a check this year or you'll receive a reduction in your assessment for next year. But you'll get credit for the seventeen hundred dollars that you've earned out of, out of that surplus. Uh, next year's screens are uh, pie charts that uh, show you our revenue sources. The blue part of the pie chart is uh, local local tax dollars, and the uh, reddish part of the pie chart is our state aid. Um, so it, the pie chart is showing uh, you know how that towns are about 50, 46 percent, 47 percent of our, our uh, sources of the budget. And how does that compare to the past? Rick uh, created a screen that shows a, a couple of uh, the pie charts. And as you can see, the top portion of this is from four or five years ago. And our towns were really carrying the load. They were, they were uh, subsidizing our revenues by a, a tune of 55, almost 56%. Uh, today in FY22, 23 era, we're down to 46% of the towns uh, supporting our budget, and we're getting more state aid. And again, I had said earlier, why is that happening? Uh, twofold, the Student Opportunity Act of the uh, state formula certainly has helped us, and our enrollment is growing, so we are no longer in hold harmless. So that means our state revenues grow, uh, the dollars actually grow year to year. And this next screen is our expenditures. So you'll see that in the red, that's the uh, that's the amount of uh, that we spend on teachers, the people who are uh, right in the classrooms, the faces in front of the students. And Rick and I did a sanity check. We took this part of the pie chart and we compared it to uh, five years ago also to see if we are out of proportion because we are a growing school. We wanted to make sure we were growing in the right way. And as you can see from the two charts, all the pie slices are fairly fairly similar to what they were four or five years ago. So that means we're not we're not growing in one area of our budget that's disproportionate to another area of our budget. So this is and, a and plus, I think it's important to note that the that the 2016 data that's on the top part of the screen, um, we spent 51 plus percent of our budget on instructional services, which is our teaching staff. Since then we hired 12 more staff and a few more paras, and it actually dropped a little bit. It, it allowed that stabilization. So this was a gut check for us to make sure that we're not hiring more than we need. And it's also making sure that where we were as far as the percentage. So that was, uh, I hoping to both of us actually because I didn't know what that graph was actually going to say and it was interesting when we did it that even though we hired a lot more staff the percentage of that on our budget remained the same and that's the end of the um, that's the end of the budget presentation uh, we'll we'll gladly take any questions at this particular point in time. thank you Rick R Russ one uh, one thing that we always uh, appreciate is a very uh, in-depth report from Franklin County Tech. Um, how, how was your capital? You, you didn't talk too much about capital yet. Were you going to do that later? No, we can talk about that now. So, um, and Russ, you can definitely chime in. Basically, what we're doing is um, in our capital plus trend over the last several years we've gone 300,000 300,000 now 250 and we are at the um, time frame where that money uh, right right now our building is um, you know holding as much as it could possibly hold we took our assembly hall we um, divided it up into four classrooms out of the company come in and build four classrooms inside of our assembly hall we had the end of our old science hallway that we had to get the chemistry teacher out there. We built our veterinary center and took over a special ed classroom. And so now we're building a veterinary clinic on our property, on the boulevard, and we're using that money for capital to um, take care of all of that. We had other capital projects that we looked at and going forward with and not going forward with. 
we are in a pipeline for an, an MSBA project and that pipeline in my estimation is anywhere between three and eight years away I can only say that because they're not going to give us a sniff until we hit 50 years old and that will be in three years and the other um, part of that is we're still under a bonding from our windows and doors project which will have eight years left as well so I think they may not do anything until that's concluded so one thing for sure we're going to be very strategic with not doing anything with the outside of the building because we know down the road we will uh, be in the pipeline uh, for the MSBA project. Uh, we were in the senior study phase the previous year, not in it this year. I'm finding out more information. I think it's still going to be a ways off, but um, we're trying to get ready for the future and the veterinary center that's going to be located on our property that will be on the boulevard will not interfere with any future MSBA project. So we were um, trying to trying to think down the road there. So the biggest project we got going is that at veterinary center. Our students are going to help reduce the cost to our local town by a significant amount because they're going to do the majority of the interior work. Um, and they're going to be helping in other aspects of the job. So what would normally be a three to five million dollar veterinary clinic will uh, probably be done just under a million dollars or pretty close to it. Ross, do you have anything? No, so I think we pretty much hit the whole the whole shebang. Um, we are um, very busy with our capital planning committees, both internally. Rick has a group of uh, staff um, and key players in the building working on the capital plan, updating the capital plan, and then our, our subcommittee of our school committee is also working on the capital plan. So we we uh, desperately do not want to go out for any borrowing in the interim for fear of delaying a bigger MSBA project. So that's why we have uh, built into our budget funds moving into capital stabilization. And we uh, will look to use those funds as wisely as possible to stretch the life of this building, like Rick said, from five to 10 years out until, uh, uh, until we can get the 75, 80% of state uh, funding or state help. So this will get me right to that point, Russ. I'm just gonna quickly go over the capital plan. Oh, excellent, thanks. So we have the capital plan on the screen. Can anybody see it? Oh. Does anyone not see it? Okay, sounds like we see it. So what we do with the capital plan is this is the veterinary clinic. This is a timeline that we worked on with the Maureen Schmidt company. And we're looking for the building to be up shell by some time uh, just at the end of the spring or the beginning of the summer. So the building should be up sometime in this red column. And if you look at erection of metal building shell, which should be up here. So this is just a construction timeline on all the various things that will get done and when. The other thing for our capital planning is these are estimates. This is interesting because all the stuff that we're looking to need to do will cost a lot of money as we move forward down the road, some not so much, like we don't have a fire alarm and sprinkler system suppression unit, that's $5 million. We don't have an emergency PA phone system. We don't have you know, our auditorium or assembly hall. So we're looking at all these kind of things in our educational plan. Then we have our draft plan for our cafeteria capital plan. And that comes to three quarters of a million dollars for all the things that are needed. Then we have a vocational capital improvement plan. And then we have a maintenance capital improvement plan. There's some big things down here, such as um, the above fuel tank is beginning to rust away. The grease place, um, that, that grease trap needs to be replaced. We have some, you know, we have new boiler controls that need to be done. And we have an old electrical switch gear that's new to the building. That would be 400 if we were, and that goes out from time to time. That shuts us right down. So that's another area. So when I total all this up, we're in the vicinity of needing about $20 million. If we do a new MSBA core building project in the vicinity of $100 million and get 80% reimbursement, the towns are going to have to vote on whether we continue to pump money into Franklin County Tech at $20 million 
or we get a brand new building for around the same price and don't have to pump the money back in. So this is just where we are with our capital group. Here's our vehicle replacement plan. We thought about that. And this is all the explanations of all that stuff. And this is the prioritized list. These are the lists that we're prioritizing, what we actually need. So out of maintenance, we probably need, if we don't get an MSBA project in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna to need to spend that money, $590,000 to get out, to keep our building right where it needs to be. Um, some of the stuff we're not gonna need, but we're gonna need at least to do modular classes. Maybe not at two million, we'll just do the lease. So we're not gonna buy them outright, but we need to lease them. So that's, a, so that's an area where we would have to be. So there's just some priorities that we'll take a look at. Um, but there's probably two or three major priorities. We just met with the group again, and um, that's where we're at there. So to answer your question about the capital, sorry that took so long, but we're trying to think about those things as we move forward. Um, so so what, what's your, what, what is your, uh, your, your shop, what is your largest shop? right now well there's a few of them right now um you know of course we're got a lot of interest in the veterinary science we had students that have displayed interest from even Sutherland of going to smith folk that are now coming to franklin county tech because we have animals on campus and we have the veterinary type of project so that was i remember I went to a Sutherland um, town meeting back probably 10 years ago, and I think it was you that mentioned, yep. are you guys ever thinking about doing animal science? Or was that Probably would cost close to fifty thousand dollars to spend to send a kid to Smith now, and as opposed to the seventeen thousand dollars you would pay um, to go to Franklin County Tech um, per pupil, that is. So um, that would be one element. And um, well, what would your other one? Well, I, I was I was just wondering what what your I, I was just wondering what the what shops. It, what. Okay, so the shops, the veterinary shop is something that's increasing. The welding shop has a waiting list. That's really surprising. That's, in, that's increased a lot. Our construction trades have increased and have a waiting list consistently year after year. And that's probably because we build a, a house annually with um, the local community. So we, we're, we are now on our third house. So students are getting real life experience in the trades. So our electrical and our carpentry is um, really beginning to fill up as well as our plumbing. So I think all of our trades are healthy and there's, now, and there's no longer a trade that is like um, a red flag. We had red flag trades in the past. We either got rid of them or we enhanced them. And when we enhance them, the enrollment goes up. An example of that would be our health technology. Uh, we enhanced that and due to COVID, um, there was there weren't a lot of kids and people going in to be a CNA, but the medical assistant pathway is huge, and that's like one of the number one needs in the area for jobs. So we added a medical assistant program just in the last few years. It just received approval, so that was an add-on to our health technology shop program, and that helps magnify the interest. So Asha. Uh, I think if you would ask that question yet again, there's probably three or four shops that are tied to the top spot. Next year, those three or four will be three or four other ones. I, it, there's not a consistent one, number one shop anymore. Right? It kind of keeps going back and forth depending on the year. Okay. David, questions? Not right now. Crystal? I'm good. Thank you. Jeffrey? Oh. <clears throat> uh, any questions from the uh, the Zoom? All right, Rick and Russ, I think we're all set with you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very you much everybody. for your presentation. Thank you.
Okay, next up is the uh, annual town meeting calendar. Yes, so um, in collaboration with the clerk put together the calendar through annual elections. Um, articles are due by Friday, March 18th. Uh, the last day to vote for ballot questions is Saturday, April 2nd. Um, which would mean the last meeting in March. We probably want to discuss that if there are any. Uh, last day to register to vote in elections and at annual town meeting is Friday, April 9th. The election warrant will be posted by Friday, April 18th. Um, oh. I think that I meant Monday, April 18th. April 18th is a Monday. Okay. But you also said at April 9th? Yeah, it's 29th, right, for the... Well, you said Friday, April 9th at some point. Yes, is that not a Friday? That's not a Friday. The Friday is April 8th. I will revisit this memo and yeah. get you an updated <laughs> one in two weeks when we meet again. Because right. I don't... I will so so the, sure. the, the biggest thing that we have to talk about is the uh, warrants, when the warrant's got to be, right? Right. Um, so the warrant has to be posted by, hopefully this date is right, um, Friday, April 22nd. Uh, and that is for the regularly scheduled um, that is a indoor <laughs> town <laughs> meeting for the following Friday, April 29th. Yep. So, so saying that, do does... Is there any any discussion about town meeting, having town meeting? Have you heard anything about why we can't have it as scheduled? Um, I I have not heard. I mean, I, I nobody has come to me directly to express concerns with having an indoor town meeting or anything like that. Okay, I would David, do you have a or have have you heard anything or crystal no not yet and i would think we'd be able to get back to our normal i would hope so okay all right as if we have to spread people out we should have enough room in there based on past attendance yep. i think all right i just want to yeah i haven't heard anything at all yet about that so all right. i just wanted to get that out there oh, yeah. all right anything else chef on that i just need to do some more homework <laughs> Okay. The uh, operating budget overview. Do we need to look at that tonight? Are you want to you want to present that tonight or? Um, I I or don't you... think so. I got some more information late today that I want to update, um, and hopefully I'll have some more revenue stuff. So it probably next week um, would be better. Um, it's just some of the numbers I, that I just plugged in were last year's numbers to carry over so it didn't look significantly lower than we actually expect it to be and I'd like to refine that a little bit and I'm also yeah. working on the select board budget which I think we're presenting at town administrator and select board budgets in two weeks and so that'll clear up some of that so. okay. okay that's good uh ARPA funds discussion? Yes, so um, last week we went through and you approved a number of projects. So I updated the memo and put some additional projects on the list, not necessarily for approval this evening, but just to begin thinking about um, the public safety projects, um, a police cruiser replacement, um, and public safety complex generating generator wiring, um, both of which the capital planning committee said if it's not going to be ARPA funds, we rec or they're going to recommend for the capital budget. Um, I think that the police cruiser may have a, a 
timing concern where ARPA funds would be yeah. better used because of the lead time to get the cruiser. Um, and we're looking at applying for a green communities grant that would award us uh, $10,000 if we purchase a hybrid cruiser. And so the poli the chief mentioned, actually, I'll, I'll bring back this information too. When the chief was here talking about it, he was asked about an all electric vehicle and he looked into the all electric vehicle. There are two that are used. Um, I think it's a Tesla Model 3 and, or the Ford Mach E. And what he said was the Tesla Model 3. Um, I think the vehicles are take a while to get here and then there's no standardized fit out equipment um, for as a police cruiser. So that would add additional time. He thinks it would be at least a year from when we order it to when we get it. He said the Ford Mach E, there is uh, fit out equipment, but it's not, I'm gonna get this wrong. It's not uh, pursuit rated, yeah. I think is what he said. So if they were to use it, it to enforce uh, an enforcement actions and there was an accident, there would be some insurance and some liability concerns with that. Um, looking at an all electric one at that time. A little ways out, unfortunately, yeah. But the, the good thing about the hybrid is it's for all intents and purposes, it's like a regular explorer in that respect, in terms of equipment and everything, which is nice. So, right. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then for education, um, the um, facilities manager, director, uh, and the superintendent talked to the capital planning committee, gave an update. Um, apparently, I think he said there are seven loops or 12 loops and seven of them don't have glycol and five of them do a certain percentage of yep. the sprinkler loops do have glycol so there is a need for some glycol replacement was was the information he brought to that um we talked about the phone system upgrade as well and the phones are used um, regularly. I asked how frequently phones from the class, and it's mostly to contact the instructors if a student needs to get sent to the office or as a parent there or something like that. So he said they, they are used um, and needed in the classrooms. Um, the boiler replacement, I believe, is the highest priority now for the schools. Uh, yeah. Superintendent Modesto sent an email. It looks like the boiler is leaking pretty significantly. Obviously, it's related to an energy issue. Um, and, and we talked about having a more comprehensive view of energy usage and fossil fuels versus renewables at the school. And the concern is that the boiler is not really functioning. It's leaking. Um, and w heading into next cold season with only one fully functioning boiler is not going to be sufficient. Um, they really need two in order to maintain it. And I think the concern is you can replace parts of it, but I think some of the parts, some of the coils have been replaced already. And even though there's one that's mainly leaking, the others are still 30 years old and so may need to be replaced as well. So it may be more cost efficient to replace the boiler. Um, and then the third is the gable, uh, sorry, the fourth is the gable vent and soffit repairs. And um, I think one side of the building has been done and they were gonna replace some of the rotting woodwork with um, plastic so that it's more durable and won't rot out. Um, other government services, uh, replacing ceiling tiles and insulation in the highway office. Apparently that's not well insulated in the, ce in the ceiling and the, the tiles are coming down. Um, 
and then uh, carpet replacement in the library. Um, yeah, and so the, those are sort of the, the next things on the list. I don't know. Um, can, can you ask the library why carpet and not tile? Like it may be a tile. sound issue, but I will ask. Yeah. Uh -huh. It may be a sound issue that it's quieter with carpeting, but... You know what I forgot to ask, too? Are they looking at something like the... Like the square, the tiles, so that if they need to replace one section, you know what I mean? I don't know if they're looking at... That'll be something we can ask. Yeah, I forgot to ask them when they... Yeah. Wednesday. They're going to think library they're gonna, they're gonna and highway are coming in Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask that tomorrow then, or Wednesday. Because the nice thing about that is that, you, you know, if you have, you know, if something that happens to a section, you just and can hear you, that. Because we've switched over to that in, in all our offices and everything, yeah. and it's, and I think Frontier is looking at that too. What's that? Like the floor tile squares as opposed to just like a huge, you know, sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that quite a bit yeah. also. And, and, and could you get the specifics on, on the phone system upgrade? What, what, does, does that, what does that entail? Is that going to be some, a, a similar, because I thought we'd done the phone. Didn't we do the phone not too long? Well, everything seems like not too long ago. But, I know. But I, I would, is, is, it, is it still the same type of phone system? Or what, what are they going to? And did they look at uh, VOP now, voiceover protocol? I think they're on VoIP now, aren't they? I think this is equipment that. Yeah, and again, I yeah. you know it'd be nice to see it uh, nice to see, and if they are looking at the boiler replacement, what what do they plan on you know, what do they plan on putting in? And again, I just think a little you know now we're you know asking for a little more detail. And the tough thing is then then there there's the potential that they could have to replace at some point the tank. And that'll yeah. be very pricey, and that's why we it sort of spurred the discussion. It's not really tied to ARPA per se, but you know, when do we bite the bullet and try to switch over? Because at some point we were talking about you know maybe putting in like heat pumps in there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when do we bite the bullet and switch over to that? Yeah. So. And and I don't have a problem with a cruiser. I know we we put the cruiser off from last year, so. Yeah. I, I mean. At least a hybrid gets us on the path to, you know, to that. Yeah, so like, well. I mean, it's, be it's definitely better than just using the straight gas one, so. There, it's, you, you gotta have some, there has to be, an, uh, you have to have an initiative to make it so that we, don't run the cruisers for hours yes. on end right. at idle. Right. Before, idle. Before it was not before it was always get a cruiser to a hundred thousand now hundred thousand miles that need to be replaced. Now now we don't talk so much about mileage, we talk about hours Service of use. Hours, yeah. And it's like, okay, well how how is it you know, how what 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 are the policies for, I mean, can you just sit and park for eight hours? And, right. and again, I mean, it's convenient, but it'd be interesting to know. Right. Okay, I'm fine. But again, I understand that the cruiser does need to be replaced. So, okay. I, 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 I would, I would, I would say that you, sh I would like to see that brought forward. From my my perspective, Jeff. At the next meeting, for yes, both. Okay. I al I also think, you know, we have nice sidewalks in now, and and I think that we don't have sufficient lighting, street lights over those sidewalks. Yeah. Case in point, right down here on the corner of South Main Street, yeah. South Main Street and Old Amherst Road. There's really yeah. no sidewalk. You have a sidewalks there, but you need street lights. Right. It's for nighttime. Also, the 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 a, a prime example where it works good is like the the North Main Street North Silver Lane. It's perfect. It's got it's got a street light there. It does another, but we need a street light at 
um, Claybrook because because there's yeah. people that there are people that are crossing there now. Yep. And you should we should have we should the crosswalks in my opinion should be lit. So yeah, I would agree. So if we could, I'd like to put that on on the airport yep. list. Okay. David Crystal, you have any thoughts? You, is I mean, br please bring them forward if there's items that yeah. that you want to see also. Okay. Yeah, I've been I've been up for the street lights for a while, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> uh, select board updates. Crystal. Nope. Okay. David. Uh, this week, uh, capital. Plan I don't think so. Just a reminder, I'm going to be out of the office next week. Um, and we'll, we'll be, we'll have limited uh, email and phone probably in the evenings. Because um, I'm going Rocky Mountains for some skiing. Nice. Oh, um, nice. Watch out for avalanches, okay, Jeff? I will try yeah, that's to. Been a tough year for <laughs> if you see an avalanche coming down the hill, get out of the way. Yeah. I, I, you know, just. <laughs> I, that's what I would do. I, I would, you know, like rip tide, ski parallel, and get out of the way. Yep. Or just tuck and just go as fast as you can down the hill. I'm going to try and get one of those. Have you seen the... Ballistic parachutes? Yeah. It, that's, yeah. It's a balloon, right? Yeah. It lifts you to the top of the avalanche. Yeah. Do you believe you that? I, I've never seen it. I think, <laughs> I think you'd be better, better locked talking to Elon Musk and ask him if uh, SpaceX could make something for you so you could... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you could do a quick launch, maybe 400, 500 feet up, and uh, parachute back down behind it. So, um, I, for for my updates, I, um, you know, one of the things um, in in our job is that we run into people that really um, make a difference. Chris Collins was one of those guys that really made a difference. And I mean, we we in the town of Sunderland take cable TV for granted. Um, but if it wasn't for the people like Bill Whitmore and Bob White and 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 a few others that in, in the beginning that Mark Gilmore from Deerfield, um, they they had a vision for community TV that we have because for a long time we didn't we spent many meetings many hours of meetings with Comcast Comcast used to like to do that and we we walk out here at 11 o'clock at night sometimes but um, Bob and who's passed away and and Bill who passed away um, they always had a vision of where they wanted to see Franklin or Frontier Cable Access, which started out as South County Access TV. But then someone said the acronym SCAT. Yeah, I was just going to say that's probably not the best um, acronym. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a chuckle with us when we had, we so they changed the name. That's good. But for a long, long time, um, FCAT, as it became to known, um, was looking to hire a director. And they f finally um, came across an individual in Chris that shared FCAT's um, passion for community TV and for the importance of getting knowledge out to an and have an informed citizenry. And Chris Chris passed away the other day and he um, he did a lot of he, he it it for us we took a step. When he became the director, he took a step in the right direction that many, many 
people that were involved with community TV always wanted to see. And Chris, Chris did that. And he helped us move forward. Um, he's going to be missed. Um, his, his vision, his personality, he had a can-do, um, he had a, a, a can-do attitude. I don't think he said no many times to something that we asked. So we're going to miss him. Um, we're going to miss Chris. And I just wanted to mention that because I, I was fortunate to know him a little bit. And I just, um, I was very, very appreciative of what he did with FCAT and community TV, not just in Sunderland, but, but Deerfield Whiteley. He brought in Conway also. So, Chris, we'll miss you. And I hope, hope your family um, knows that you, that there are many, many people around Franklin County that, and, and Hampshire County and other places that uh, think about Chris on a regular basis. So, anything else at that, John? We miss him. We miss will. All right, is there anything else tonight, Jeffrey? Did, did we hit the open annual town meeting warrant item? Uh, do we want to open it, open the warrant now? Um, or is it a little too early? Do it next week? I still think it's early, because if uh, we, it's, Pretty much, we got time. It's time. What? Yeah, I think it. Um, we, I think we have to close it March 18th. We can open it now then. Yeah, yeah, I think it's supposed to open for yeah. six weeks. Yeah. All right, so I'll take a motion to open the warrant, annual town meeting warrant. Motion to open. I second it. Okay. There's a motion to uh, open the annual town meeting warrant all those